Luke chapter 2 this weekend, beginning at verse number 1. This is how the Bible reads. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken from, taken of the Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. Because he belonged to the house and the line of David, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Allow me to reiterate for extra emphasis, verse number seven, it says, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. On this Christmas Eve, I wanna just declare to you, Merry Christmas from the manger. Merry Christmas from the manger. Summons by Caesar through a situation that seemed silly and insignificant, Joseph and Mary have traveled 80 miles from Nazareth to the town of Bethlehem. When they arrive, they find that the little town of Bethlehem is busy. The census of Caesar has brought an unusual amount of business to this little town. Booming with the hustle and bustle of citizens navigating the streets, trying to make the most of their time there, everybody has one major question that has to be answered. Where will they lay their heads tonight? This is significant because you know the importance of having a safe place to lay your head. The text tells us clearly that this is problematic for Mary and Joseph because when they get to Bethlehem, there is no more room in the inn. All of the rooms on Priceline, Expedia, Kayak, and Hopper have been accounted for. They've traveled 80 miles, tired and fatigued, with nowhere to rest from their weary journey. I'm not sure how it happened, Pastor Clark. Perhaps... They were still trying to accumulate enough points on their credit cards to get a room. Perhaps it was because they got off to a late start and everybody beat them there. Ms. Jan, maybe it was because, similar to the case of my wife when she carried both my sons, it didn't matter where we were in the journey when she had to go to the restroom, she had to go. M maybe... It was Joseph, I'm, I'm sure that since this was his hometown, that he was confident that one of his family members would have an extra room available. But whatever the situation, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is clear. Mary and Joseph don't have any connections. And so when they arrive to Bethlehem, there is no room available for them. And did I tell you Mary is very much pregnant? And so in my sanctified imagination, as I read over this text for the 147th time, I saw as they arrived to the last hotel, the innkeeper saying to them, I don't have any rooms, but if you go round back, there's a barn round back. It's not much, but it's the best I got. And so tired from their travel and fatigued by their inability to find a room for the night, Mary and Joseph settle for a stable. The Bible says when Jesus was born, Jesus was born in a manger, a manger, a meager setup for the Messiah, a manger, the place where royalty had been relegated to a manger. A crude and cruel crib for the Christ child. Church, the greatest baby ever to be born was born 
in a barn. Far from the regal and royal reality of a palace, Jesus was born in a place of rejection. And for many of us, we look over the manger scene. And the reason why we look over it is because when we think about it, it's not the kind of place where you would want to have a baby and especially not the greatest baby of all time. First Lady, if anybody deserved a bougie baby shower, <laughs> it was Jesus. He, he was king. And yet he chose to be born not in a, man, a mansion, but in a manger, a feeding trough. It's not a place where you expect the Son of God to be born. God chose to make sure that royalty was placed in something that was really regular and really raggedy. And the question that has to be asked here for the purposes of this sermonic presentation is, is why? Was this an accident? Was this a mistake? Was this a matter of happenstance? Was the God of the universe, our heavenly father, like most of us who become fathers, just not prepared for the arrival of his son? Did Caesar Augustus's plan catch God off God? off guard. How could God let his only son be born here into this? After all, he was a king, a king deserving of a palatial palace, a king deserving of the pomp and circumstance. He was king, deserving of being raw, wrapped in regal and royal rags, a king who at least, Dr. Anderson, deserved to be properly birthed by the hands of the best physician in the town of Bethlehem. How could God allow his one and only son to be born in a barn? He's king, but more than king, he is God. The great German theologian Bonhoeffer says that God is lying in that manger. A God who was so powerful that he could have very easily just descended from heaven, rode in on a cloud with the trumpets blaring and the angels singing. He could have showed up in a way that everybody would know that the Savior had come into the world. Come on, God. Why here? You don't get a second chance to make a first impression. How could the Messiah be born in a place where most of us would have missed him? Christmas teaches us that purpose has a place. To quote one of our pastors, uh, seminary professors, there's a geography to God's purposes. And the manger is a specific place that teaches us really one seminal point, and it's this. Jesus was born in a manger to show us that he is reachable. On the first night on earth, the king of glory, the son of God, slept in a feeding trough where animals fed. What a picture of God's desire to identify with those who are humble and poor. He wasn't born in the best hospital. He, he didn't even get a chance to get to the Bethlehem Marriott or the Bethlehem Four Seasons. He didn't even make it to the Red Roof Inn. He was born in something that everybody could connect with. The King of Kings was born into poor and humble circumstances, born as a human, born to serve. He could have very easily chosen to be born in a mansion by the governor, but, uh, but he chose to be born in a manger to a carpenter and a round-the-way girl. He chose to leave the riches of heaven and come to earth and to enter and, in, and to endure all of our troubles, and he did so for us. The manger is a reminder to us that he did not come to be a king that was concerned with luxury and comfort. No, he came for the least, the lost, the looked over, the left out to endure pain and suffering for the sake of others. Friend, the manger reminds us 
of this simple principle, the manger matters because it's a reminder to us that no matter who you are or where you come from, God is with you. That's the whole sermon really right there. No matter your race, your grace, or your space in this place, God has come down to meet you right where you are. It's the theological term incarnation. The idea that God became one of us and when he came, he didn't come just for the people who were fit for the power. He came for those who never got a seat at the table. He came for those not allowed in the temple. He came for you and for me to remind us that God is reachable and available to everybody. The poor and the rich. The up and the down. He is the God who is incarnate. That's what John reminds us in John chapter 1 verse 14 when he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Literally, God came down in the flesh. That African church father, Augustine tried to capture the mystery of the incarnation this way by saying maker of the son he is made under the son and the father he remains but from his mother he goes forth creator of heaven and earth was born on earth under heaven unspeakably wise and yet he was wisely speechless filling the world he lies in a manger Ruler of the stars, he nurses at his mother's bosom. He is both great in the nature of God and small in the form of a servant. God came down. And here's what it simply means to you and I. And I'm almost done with the sermon. What it means is that no matter where you are in life, God's power is made available to you. God's presence is made available to you. And because God chose to come down, you and I cannot merely consign him to heaven because he has made his way on earth. You and I, one theologian says, cannot push him aside as a figment of our imagination because he has come to us face to face. He is God who has entered fully into our human mess, willing to live in poverty, li willing to live as a refugee, li willing to associate with people who have major issues. Can I remind somebody who will help me give God praise this weekend that God came down to associate with you and me. To associate with the outcast. He came down to give us help to the poor to heal the sick, to come for the broken. He came down because he cares about immigrants and he cares about strangers. He came down for you and for me. He didn't just come to be near to us. He came to be there for us. In coming to be with us, he didn't just come to be near us. He came to be for us in our poverty. Can I remind somebody that God knows exactly what you need when you need it? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, my sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. I don't know about you, friends, but that's reason enough to give God praise, that God is with us. Spurgeon says God is with us and it should always be a source of good news to us because whenever we declare Emmanuel, whenever we declare God is with us, it brings terror to hell. Whenever we declare God is with us, it's eternity sonnet. Whenever we declare God is with us, it's heaven's hallelujah. Whenever we declare God is with us, it is the shout of the glorified and the song of the redeemed. It is the chorus of the angels and it is the everlasting oratio of the great orchestra of the sky. Somebody shout, he is Emmanuel. He's God with us. Which means he knows what you need, he understands where you are, and he supplies whatever you're lacking. And can I remind somebody this weekend who may feel like you're by yourself, that just because you may be alone doesn't mean that God is aloof or that God is distant to what you're going through. You are not alone because just like you, just because, just because you felt like you're by yourself doesn't mean you are by yourself. Can I encourage somebody as you gather around? 
around whatever Christmas tree and around whatever family, whether you like them or not, that you are not forsaken. For God says, I've got you in my care. You don't have to worry and you don't have to fear because the manger reminds us that God is always near. I'm almost done with the sermon. Anybody grateful that God's with you this weekend? In your joys, he's with you. In your pain, he's with you. In your trials, he's with you. In your triumphs, he's with you. In your seasons of sickness, he's with you. In your strength, he is with you. In victory, he's with you. In vulnerabilities, he's with you. In success, he's with you. In your struggles, he's with you. When you're walking through what feels like the valley of the shadow of death, God is I'm done, but my friend, Dr. J. Lawrence Turner, of Mississippi Boulevard, Memphis, Tennessee, helps me to close the sermon by reminding us that in light of all of the atrocities that have been happening in Palestine over the last few months, that while you and I will gather around family and friends here in America, that Christmas has been canceled in Bethlehem. There are no Christmas trees or sparkling lights in Manger Square or along the cobblestone streets that should be bustling with foreign touristers, tourists rather this time of year. There will be no Christmas parade with musicians weaving through the old city's labyrinth walkway. There's no Santas on the street corners doling out joy to children. The very place that brought us Christmas ain't having Christmas this year. And it's, it's because of war, and I don't have to tell you what's going on or what's happening over there. You already know, and I'm certain for most of you, you've already formed your opinions about what's right, who's right, and who's wrong. But here's what I will say as I push toward the close. You know that the world is broken and in need of God to come down when a country is given the freedom to annihilate another people as the whole world watches in real time. That's not why I brought this up. The reason I bring it up this weekend is Pastor Clark, amidst the crazy chaotic circumstances surrounding the experiences over there in Palestine, there's an image right outside the Lutheran church there in Bethlehem. It's an image that they are very familiar with. They see it every year. Outside of that church is a nativity scene. Except this year, is slightly different. Instead of Jesus being laid on top of a cobblestone manger with hay, Jesus has been laid on top of a pile of rubble. With those who are part of his holy family trying to dig through the rubble to find Jesus. And it's a twofold reminder to each of us as we celebrate Christmas this year. One, of the reality that if Christ were here today, this is what he would have to endure. But it's also a reminder to us on a higher, holier, and heavier level that even when your life has been reduced to rubble, I think I'm done now, even when your life can only be defined by brokenness and bombings, even when you can't sing to find your way out of the pain that you're in when none of the stuff that used to work for you seem to no longer work when your life has been reduced to ruins if you just put Jesus at the top of it can I tell somebody you still can find a reason to rejoice now I'm not trying to go get everybody and I'm definitely not trying to jerk a cheap shout out of anybody but I do see a reason for celebration here because no matter how crushing life becomes you can still have hope that even when it feels like your life is crumbling around you you still have something to shout about and I wonder is there anybody here who can help me close the message by thanking God for the reality that sometimes God will put glimmers of hope in places where you least expect it. They didn't expect to find Jesus in a manger and they didn't expect to find Jesus in your piles of rubble but I came to remind somebody that Jesus came down through 40 and 2 generations to give us hope in the midst of our despair in the
the midst of our ruin, in the midst of our rubbish, and in the midst of our rubble, God came down to give us hope for pardon and hope of peace with God, hope of glory, because God will get you out your mess. I got to get y'all out of here, but before I let you go, I came to remind somebody that while you may not be able to thank God for the stuff that you got under the tree this year, you can thank God for the fact that even when your life has been reduced to rubble, that you've got a God who came down because he's willing to lay in your mess. Somebody here, Christmas don't feel like Christmas because they're not at the table this year, but even when your life feels like it's been broken and your heart has been broken you've got a God who is with you would you look at somebody and help me close the sermon and tell them thank God that even when everybody and everything walks away I've got a God who will show up in unexpected places he came down to lay with you in the midst of your rubble but here's the even greater news that he didn't just come to console you in your mess but he came to rescue you from your mess and help you rebuild your life is there anybody in the room who can help me praise him that you've got a God who came down to bring you beauty for your ashes, the oil of gladness for your mourning, and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And because he's given you garments of praise for spirits of heaviness, I will bless I feel Holy Ghost the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth oh come let us adore him I said oh come let us adore him I said oh come let us adore him for he is Christ I said he's Christ for he alone is worthy I said he alone is worthy I said he alone is worthy cause he's Christ the Lord in him there is no failure I said in him there is no failure in him there is no failure cause he's Christ the Lord the Holy One, my elder brother, somebody give him praise, cause he's Christ, the Lord. So Merry Christmas from the manger. And if you're grateful that God shows up in unexpected places, give him praise and give him Friend, hear me. The reality of the Christmas story is no matter where you are in life, Christ came to meet you there. And I'm talking to somebody here. You have yet to give your life to Christ because you feel like you got to get yourself together. No, Christ has already come down to the lowest of lows. So that no matter how low you go, even if you get to rock bottom, he's there serving as the rock on the bottom. And so I want to invite somebody very quickly as we get ready to leave. Before we leave, I want to invite somebody to give yourself the greatest Christmas gift you can give yourself. It's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come. 
I'm going to invite everybody to stand to your feet. If you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to join our church, if you're in the room, all you've got to do is, as soon as the worship experience is over, we got you out of here enough time so you can do this and still make it to your brunch. Why don't you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ? All you got to do is join our spiritual decision team. Room 145, as soon as the worship experience is over with. Or if you want to make that decision to join our church, to be connected to this Christ, to buy your own self, to give your own self the greatest gift you could ever give yourself, you're watching online. All you've got to do is dial the number on the screen, 877-632-0702. Oh, come, let's sing it one time. Let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore One more time. Cry. I cannot live without him. I can't. 